Hello everyone, good morning. Yeah, we're back for another round of Comp 5 to 6 uh, to get settled in. I thought it might be fun if uh, I asked you where you're joining in from today. I think I've never done it before uh, in this class, and I'm, I'm curious to see what you have to say about this. Um, okay, uh, most people from Liverpool at the moment, but that's only a few responses. Uh, give you uh, another minute to settle in. Um, okay, interesting. Croatia. Yeah. Other people from the UK. Okay. Um, I'll leave it open for a second. I want to start with a few announcements. And um, we have quite a few to go through. So I want to uh, really start this on time. Uh, announcement number one is about the class test. Uh, I noticed that I did publish the marks, uh, but you couldn't see your answer. And now that the, the due date is over and the test is over, there's no reason to hide this information. So I changed the setting on Canvas. You can now see what you answered and which answer was correct for that, um, for that question that you got. But remember that essentially all of you got a different uh, instance. The, the functions that you compared in this asymptotic question are uh, randomly chosen from a large pool. And so you will uh, most most definitely have different questions uh, for different people. So uh, if you're curious, go to Canvas and, and check out uh, what you can find there. You just click on the same, um, the quiz for, for the class test one, and then you should be able to see your answer. Um, the second thing is the departmental uh, survey um, that I told you about. And um, maybe let me just show this here instead of only giving you. So this is just the, the quiz summary of how many people have submitted so far. And um, let's see. So you can see this now, I think. Can we get this out of the way? It was a couple of standard questions. I didn't select the questions. Um, these were centrally chosen from the from the department for all modules. So uh, I resisted the temptation to add more questions to it. I think it should be kept very brief and short. Um, I was happy to see that many people feel confident that they can succeed in this module. That's great, even though a few people strongly disagree and um, that's a bit of a concern. So maybe, uh, yeah, reach out if there's specific reasons for that. Um, maybe we can do something about it. Um, feeling connected was a little less enthusiastically agree. Uh, many agree, but uh, there were also a few that felt a little less connected. This is definitely the, the big challenge um, this year. So um, uh, you might be delighted to know that uh, Ben's back for the actual tutorials later today at 4 p.m. I will give you a, a, the, the quick rundown of the tutorial four that we had to skip last week. Hopefully this helps you to, be, to get a bit more connected. Also, I encourage you to use Campus Wire not just for questions around the class, but maybe also a bit more um, on, on less serious topics. It, just play with it a bit. Anything that helps, um, to get you connected with other students is probably a good idea. Um, let me know if you have other ideas what we could do centrally organized to, to help with that. The next question was um, whether you believe you're contributing and engaging effectively with this module. And um, most people seem to agree, um, except for a, a few who were not so, not so sure. Um, I think this is overall positive, so I'm, I'm happy to see that you're you're happy with your own engagement. Um, you understand, the question was, the next question was whether you understand how you will be assessed. And um, I'm very pleased to see that no one at least completely disagreed and just two people said they neither agree nor disagree. So uh, it seems that it, it got clear what the assessments will be, or what the assessments are. We've already started with a few of them. And um, yeah, if, if you ever have questions, you know how to reach us. Um, the improvements, they cannot be seen on this screen. You can only open the uh, 
individual analysis for this, um, which is a bit cumbersome. I don't want to do this. There were a couple of interesting uh, suggestions. Um, maybe I'll uh, I'll address some of these offline. Um, one was regarding technical troubles in either lecture or tutorials. Um, please raise those as soon as, as something happens. Then we can try to uh, mitigate the, the impact. Uh, another comment was about the speed of lectures. Um, and uh, this, is, this is a typical problem. Um, one student reported it was too fast. I've heard from others that the speed is fine. So there's no, no one size fits all, but uh, at least you can watch the recordings at the pace you like. That's, that's probably the best you can offer. It's a downside of, of doing things live, where it's one speed for everyone, as opposed to recordings. But then again, remembering your results um, from the survey yesterday, uh, most people feel that this, the live lectures in total offer a better learning experience than the pre-recorded videos. So this is a, a trade-off to be made. Um, I guess it's hard to make the lectures fit for everyone. So I would probably, for now, uh, try to keep it uh, consistent. Um, that was mostly mostly it for this uh, survey. Um, there's a, another person who answered after I looked at, so maybe there's some, uh, some feedback that I didn't uh, read yet. If that's the case, I will uh, get back to it. All right, let's um, try to switch back to our Slido question. Um, okay, 31 people seem to be connected. Um, so most of you are in Liverpool or close by, and uh, a few people are scattered around. Um, but not as not as much as I would have feared. So um, that's probably also an interesting uh, thing. It means many of you are actually still staying in your uh, in your term uh, apartments, right? Maybe uh, I should have asked whether you're living at home or uh, in in some accommodation. Maybe that's for the next time. So thanks for playing along with this one. Um, back to the announcements, there's uh, some more to be done. So we talked about this and we talked about this. Um, I, I announced that the tutorials are back to normal, starting with this tutorial sheet five um, that you will look at with Ben later today and on Friday. And uh, right after this class, um, I'll go with you through the second problem on the tutorial sheet four. Uh, that's that will be about, what was it about? The first one was about how to compute and in parallel. We talked about that yesterday in a small round. And whatever the second problem was, uh, I can't remember at the moment. We'll find out. Um, and the last point that I also made in a different context, um, use Campus Wire for all sorts where you feel it's, it's useful, uh, but definitely use it to ask questions also on the content of the lecture. If there's few like few questions coming, it could either mean that everything is clear and it was just so well explained in the lecture that you didn't need uh, to follow up any questions. That's kind of brilliant, but um, judging from experience, a little unlikely. It's um, it's more likely a sign of of you not having uh, not having digged through all the details yet because of other deadlines. So I expect this will come at a later stage, and um, yeah, try to uh, try to go through the material, try to go through the tutorial problems. Those should trigger these questions. I think that's enough for announcements. So let me switch back to our unit six. Yeah, you can save that. And uh, we were talking about tries yesterday. So um, just as a, a little recap, a try is is such a, a kind of tree. Um, it's defined you um, using a set of strings. In this case, this is all the strings that you see here listed in the leaves of this tree. 
And there is um, a unique try that corresponds to these um, symbols. It's different from binary search trees where, uh, remember, depending on how you insert it, in what order you inserted the keys, you uh, obtained a slightly different tree. And then we had to talk about some of these trees are really bad because they're long and, and uh, path-like. Other trees are good if they're essentially uh, short and, and, <laughs> and wide, bushy, I don't know. Um, this is not happening with tries. The order of insertions doesn't matter because um, every every key knows exactly which path it will go, because the path is given exactly by following the string. So if I had the try without that string, there would not be this branch. If I were to insert a b a a b and then the dollar, remember we added the dollar so that all the strings are prefix free. I would start at the root, follow the edge for the first letter. That's an a. So I would go down the edge A, then I would go down the edge B for the second letter, and then I'm at a point where the next letter in my string is an A, but there's only an edge going out of this node with a B prior to inserting this one. So I would create a new edge and a new node with the label A, A, B, until I reach the end of my string. And this is, uh, this is always leading to the same try, no matter which order you insert the strings in. Which also means that the um, the search time is essentially independent of all the other try all the other strings in the try. It only depends on how long the string is that you're searching. This is something we talked about yesterday. Now uh, we also have this more space efficient version of a standard try, where um, you take all the unary paths, so all paths formed by edges with nodes in between that only have a single outgoing edge, like in this case and in this case. And there's many more examples that I didn't highlight here. And uh, you make all these paths a single edge. They're basically just connecting this node and the root. So you might as well do a single edge like so. And uh, to be space efficient, we don't want to store all those um, path labels. We only store here the first character and uh, then the internal nodes have to store additional information so that you know which character next to compare. And then in the leaves, you would actually store uh, the, the full string because that information is otherwise not represented in the compact try. Whereas in the standard try over here, you wouldn't really need to store the string a second time in the leaves because the information is already contained in the edge labels on the path. All right, so much uh, for that for now. Um, that's what we discussed yesterday, and uh, we discussed how to use this for text indexing. Uh, Preprocess a text by splitting it into words and then making it possible to search for words. Um, but the issue is this doesn't uh, this doesn't always work if there is no notion of words in your application. In this next subsection, I want to introduce suffix trees. These will be the, the star data structure of this unit that uh, seem to, to magically solve a lot of interesting problems. They first solve the text indexing problem, but we'll see they are also applicable to many other uh, problems on strings. And uh, they turn out to be versatile and um, a really a threshold concept. Once you understood suffix trees, suddenly you can, you can solve um, more complicated problems efficiently. And um, they, all, they all start with um, these simple tries that we just, um, that we just defined. So let's, let's see how this works here. A magic data structure. Uh, before I want to show you how suffix trees work or what they are really, I want to um, motivate a little bit uh, how, how formidable problems they can solve by uh, looking at this specific problem. It's the longest common substring problem. Um, it's a, an intuitive question. Um, maybe it's not the most immediate that you would come up with, but it does arise in, in applications. Uh, so you're given a list of strings 
these can be of different lengths and uh, well they are over a common alphabet say but otherwise we don't have any uh, restrictions so here's here's an example and the goal is to find the longest substring that occurs in all of these strings so in the example here we only have two and uh, because the second is fairly short you could check that alive occurs here and here and uh, if if you spend some more time on this example, you will see that this is indeed also the, the longest or, or a longest repeated sub, common substring. Uh, in, in general, there could be several of the same length and then we can return any of these. So this is a simple to state problem, but imagine you're given these strings. Uh, how would you approach this? Uh, how would you find this? Um, this shortest, this this longest uh, common substring. Um, you definitely need time to read all the strings. That's uh, no doubt about that. Um, and it it turns out you can actually solve this problem in this in asymptotically the same time, only a constant factor more. But how on earth would that work? Uh, because it's it seems like you have to check all possible substrings, and even then, all possible substrings of one string. You would have to go through all the other strings and see if they occur somewhere. You could use something like our um, string matching algorithms, so you get that part efficiently. But going through all possible substrings, that's already quadratic in the size of, of the shortest string, and you would have to, to search through all the others. So it's it's quite unclear how to do this efficiently, and clearly not easy to do in this in this optimal linear time, the same time as you need to scan all read all the texts, all the uh, strings once. Um, and indeed, uh, suffix trees solve this. So um, let me show this in big. So uh, suffix trees allow you to do exactly that. Um, we'll see that you can construct them in linear time um, for this specific problem. We'll, we'll come back to that later today. And uh, they allow you to do exactly that, even though it seems not possible at first. And to give more um, more uh, weight to this claim, here's a, a quote from from a book. Uh, Dan Gusfield has written this this uh, book, which is essentially the Bible on suffix trees. It's the most comprehensive books book of applications of suffix trees. And uh, he says. Although the longest common substring problem uh, looks trivial now, given our knowledge of suffix trees, uh, Don Knuth, um, famously known as the inventor of, of LaTeX, but also uh, the author of, of the influential book series, The Art of Computer Programming, in a sense, uh, one, of the, one of the fathers of theoretical computer science and the analysis of algorithms. And a, a very clever person, um, called a genius by many, etc. So the, in, in 1970, he conjectured that a linear time algorithm for this problem, uh, longest common substring, would not be possible. He didn't see a way, and he thought there is no way. Uh, and yet, he was he was proven wrong. Now, this, this happens occasionally. Even very clever people um, sometimes don't see a, a clever solution, and then someone else comes up with it. That's what happens in, in science uh, all the time or occasionally and uh, repeatedly, maybe not all the time. But it's still remarkable because he was right with many other conjectures. Uh, so this is this is interesting. And uh, it also maybe motivates you a bit more to learn about what this magic data structure really is. And uh, here it is. This is the definition of suffix trees. It's not very complicated if you read it like this. A suffix tree, I use this, this calligraphic T to denote the, the tree just to make it, um, make it distinguishable from the text, the normal T. The suffix tree of for a text is the compact tri of all the suffixes of T. And uh, we append this dollar sign again so that all the suffixes are prefix free, that no suffix of t is a prefix of another suffix. So uh, we will always assume that this nth character of t is set to dollar and the dollar sign again is some symbol that is not in our alphabet, um, an artificial end of file character if you want. 
nice and simple, right? Um, very easy in a sense to define. Um, and maybe at this point, let us uh, look at a, a, a quick example um, of uh, how, how this might be constructed. This was also a little bit of a, a recap about tries again. Um, so let me do uh, a smaller example. Example. This might already take some time, but let's do banana and see how far we get. So this is our string. Now uh, we take all the suffixes. So uh, that's banana and that's anana and it's nana and anna and na and a dollar. And you correct me if I'm making mistakes. Okay, there were some questions that I overlooked. Sorry for that. Um, maybe I'll come back to these after this example. If I make any stupid mistakes during this construction, you will help me out and point it out to me, right? I count on you. Okay, uh, these are all the suffixes of the text. And now we insert them into a compact try. Now, it's a bit tricky to do the compact try in one shot. So at least for the manual construction, let's do first the standard try. Uh, and then we create the try afterwards. Okay. So we start with the root. And uh, let's do the longest one first. Um, so this is banana. So I have a B. Then um, I have an A. Banana, banana, and the dollar. And uh, here I'll I'll just put um, zero for the start index. This starts at zero. This at one. At two. At three. At four. At five. And at six. And that's um, zero. One. Two. Three. Four. Five. Six. That's all. These are the suffixes of, of banana. So we've inserted the first one. Now we have to insert the second one, anana. Okay, it starts with an A, so we branch off in the root. And uh, then, let's see, I'm trying to think a little bit ahead of myself. So let's uh, branch out here. Do we ever have something else after an A, then an N? Well, at least a dollar at the end. So let's let's keep it like that. N N nah. This makes for a great recording. And the dollar sign. And that brings us to well the suffix starting at one. Okay, and you, I guess you see the picture now, roughly how this goes. And uh, we need another edge here for nana. Na mm, uh, and the dollar. And that brings us to the suffix starting at two. Uh, a few more left. Anna. It actually goes A N A and then branches off with the dollar. So that was not too not too much work. We didn't have to create other nodes. And the same for na N A. We branch off with the dollar here and put in the four. And a dollar is similar. We branch off here. A and then the dollar is starting at five. And just the dollar, let me put that down here, that starts at six. Okay. That is the standard try. Now we want the compact try. So we take this standard try and do the compaction construction from, from last time. Uh, so uh, let's move this slightly over here and make it a little smaller. So I can fit this next to me. Um, the con con the contraction is now. Um, okay, I should uh, leave room. We start with zero here, and then the a, b, and dollar they stay because these are leading to notes. Sorry, the a and the dollar stay because these are leading to notes that uh, don't have exactly one child. Okay. 
And uh, then this leads to a note with one. The dollar leads immediately to a leaf with six. Um, and uh, here the banana is actually contracted into a single edge and leads immediately to the leaf. Okay, so this here we got rid of a lot of nodes. And in the last case, um, we branch off to a node that now looks at the second letter. It starts with an N. We get rid of the A here. Okay. Uh, so let's let's go to this node A. That's this one. Now uh, there's two branches. The one with the dollar is is leading immediately to a leaf. So that's one thing that's easy. The other one again leads to a branching node here. And so that looks at the third character then, of the character at position three, and uh, starts with an N. From that, we branch off with a dollar to the subject starting at position three. And the, in the other direction, we have an N, and that leads us immediately to another leaf. Okay. So you see how these are connected and how uh, we get many fewer uh, nodes in this case. We're left with this node over here. And um, that one is, you don't see my mouse anymore, right? Um, that one here uh, has the NA, so that has a child with the dollar that leads to leaf four. And it has another child also leading to a leaf, that's this, okay? And uh, if you want, you can draw the connection between the corresponding nodes. So this is the root, this corresponds to that one, this corresponds to that one, um, and I'm, I'm not doing all of them, just the internal ones. So you can see how these correspond to each other. Um, I just wanted to give um, a very slow uh, example again of how tries work, because uh, many people haven't seen tries before. Uh, there were a few questions um, that I wanted to address. Um, let's do the easy one first. Um, the comments on the class test. Uh, I suppose this refers to comments that you give on the evaluation. Um, I'm not sure if I get uh, flagged when these are added, so um, I can I can try to look over them. Uh, if you meant something else, maybe you have to clarify. Um, the other question was, I suppose, uh, when we had the earlier example from for the tries. So let me go back a little bit on the slides. to the try example. So the question was, if we search for A, A, do we in the first step have to compare the first character with both A and B, or do we go uh, to A right away? Um, if we search for A, A in this try, uh, well, if, if, if this was not the example you're referring to, Franco, um, let me know. Um, if we go A, A dollar, in, in either of the tries, we have to follow the, the edges down. I see. The question might be, um, do we have to compare all these characters, or do we just jump in the right direction? Uh, that's a detail that depends a bit on how you represent tries, but we will usually assume that you implement uh, the children of a try with an array. And the array is in this indexed by the letters. So you can, in one step, jump to exactly the right child in, in constant time, or find out that this child pointer is null and uh, there is no such child. Um, I hope this was, this was the question um, you had in mind here. Um, so this is, uh, this is about how to represent tries internally in a computer. And there's basically two options. You can either have, um, as I said, an array indexed by the alphabet, then uh, you hopefully have a not too big alphabet to do that. The other option is uh, to, to store another dictionary in each node that maps alphabet characters to a child link. That's also possible. You could do a binary search tree inside each little node. 
um, but you would have an additional uh, running time factor log of the the number of children then. So log sigma in the worst case. So people usually think of tries as having um, a way to go to the children in constant time, looking only at one character, not comparing the characters one by one. But that's uh, that's an important point, yeah. Thanks for the question. All right, um, back to the other try we were looking at. Um, this one, I hope I didn't goof in the example, um, but you see, what, what I want to get a across at this stage is suffix trees are not by themselves magic. The definition is very simple. Just build a try of all the suffixes. Uh, we do obsess about it being a compact try, um, but other than that, uh, there's no magic at this stage. And uh, here's a slightly bigger example. Um, my, uh, okay, it doesn't work. My my favorite uh, string that you will see many times in this um, in this unit is banana ban, because it has lots of self similarity. If you take all the suffixes of that string and build the same type of try, um, you get this picture just drawn sideways so that um, it nicely fits on the slide. This is the compact try in the standard way um, we draw it, except that um, here I, I cheated a bit and put the long labels on the edges. We don't really have that. Um, and, and the first thing is we don't have to store all the strings in the leaves again, because we know there are suffixes of one fixed string, so we store that fixed string instead and the, a starting index. Um, and of course, this is not how we represent it in the computer. I mentioned this before. The compact try is actually uh, storing just the first letter of all the edge labels and then um, stores what is the next index that is compared. So this is, uh, again, um, what we uh, what we think of is often this. This is what you should have in mind when you try to work with suffix trees. But if you program them, what you really do is, is this, uh, the compact try as we've seen it before, and the uh, leaves only store the starting index of the suffix. How can we construct um, a suffix tree? And this is where the magic starts. Um, we can do something like what I've just shown you on an example. We insert all the suffixes one by one in a try. That works, uh, but it takes um, quadratic time because uh, you have to search, you have to follow the search path for each suffix. So it's essentially inserting one of length n, one of length n minus one, one of length n minus two, all the way down to one. But half of them are at least n half, so those already give you a, a n squared over four um, of of total time. In quadratic time, you can do a lot of string problems already. Some are not even obvious how to do in quadratic time, but many are. This is not interesting. If your string is the whole human genome, you cannot afford quadratic time. It's just not, it just won't finish. So the suffix tree by itself, the definition is very simple and not magic at all. But uh, the straightforward way to construct it doesn't help. Then it's not really useful. The amazing result that uh, people found is you can actually construct the suffix tree in linear time, um, the same time asymptotically, only a constant factor difference, than just reading the text once. That's, in essence, the time you need to construct this, this complicated tree. Uh, the algorithms are a bit tricky. Uh, they date back to um, shortly after Knuth made this conjecture, I think. Um, in the 70s. They were uh, improved successively. They started out to be very complicated. Uh, they were certainly a, a theoretical breakthrough, but they also by now have heavy influence in practice. And um, towards the end of this module, uh, of this unit, I will, I will actually show you a way how to do this, how to construct suffix trees in, in, in linear time. And uh, by now, the algorithms have become much cleaner so that they're actually uh, definitely understandable. 
but they build on several steps and we'll have to work our way through there before we finally get to this result. What we'll do for now is we just take the linear time construction granted and uh, first ask the question, let's suppose we have this, this magic box. So suppose there is a way to get this um, as a treat this as a black box and there is a way to construct suffix trees in linear time. What can we do with this? And uh, we'll look at that first. I think it's a little early for a break, also because the first 10 minutes was just me uh, chit-chatting about uh, the announcements. So let's look through the applications first, and then we do our little break. In the next stuff section, I want to look at other problems apart from the string at from the text indexing problem. Um, well, we'll also look at that actually. So um, how about we just erase that line? I wish you just scroll back in time. Um, I can actually do that for the recording, so let's do it. In the next subsection, I want to look at applications of suffix trees. We'll see that they can solve the text indexing problem, but they can also solve uh, several other interesting string problems, including this uh, longest common substring problem that Don Knuth conjectured not to be solvable in linear time but suffix trees actually make this possible. So here's again um, a suffix tree example. Uh, as I said before, you should really think about suffix trees as this thing on the right. Uh, so suppose there were all the, uh, all the labels of the edges spelled out as strings like this. That is just to make it um, easier to think about it. It's actually represented in the computer like this, and this will this will be important to make sure that the space works out. Um, but uh, for working with them, we will just pretend that this is what we have, and we can then, in a second step, we can think about how to simulate anything that these these labels can do in in the way they're actually stored in the tree. Uh, a little. Additional technical assumption is that we'll also assume each internal node has a pointer to the leftmost, leftmost leaf in its subtree. Uh, this is something that um, you can easily, once the, the tree is constructed, you can easily walk through the entire tree once and uh, make sure that this is true. But um, we'll assume that, for example, the root points to this one and this one points to this one. So it's just an additional field in um, in each node. And uh, well, here in this example, it looks like it's always just a, a child of that node, but that is not in general true. You can have uh, cases if you if you suppose that these two branches were swapped the other way around, um, then you would jump down to the seven, which is not a child, but a grandchild. And in, in general, it could be arbitrarily far, uh, arbitrarily deep in the tree. All right. So that's, um, that's just a technical assumption. Uh, it's easy to maintain and easy to uh, make sure that this is true. Uh, but this will be, this will make the uh, applications easier to discuss. Okay, time for you to get active. Um, I uh, Before I want to talk about text indexing in more detail, here's uh, a question for you. Um, I'll try to leave this, leave this here so that you can see the tree. Um, you're given a suffix tree here on the left. And um, the question is, how much does this tell you about whether a pattern occurs in the text here? So, uh, take all the answers that are correct for this specific example. So the text that gives this suffix tree and this given pattern. I'll give you a minute to work on it and uh, maybe show the big suffix tree instead. It's the same, <laughs> big surprise. I'd like to see a few more, um, a few more answers before we move on.
Okay, I see 15 people have voted. Maybe we can get to something like 20, 25. It was 30 in the first poll. So the magic number should be our 25, right? Maybe what I should have added is, um, I don't know. I put in another option. If if you feel like you have no idea what I'm asking, then uh, just say don't know. Uh, that's also interesting um, to see if if uh, if I lost you. Okay, we're getting close to twenty five. So two more, come on, we can do this. And uh, it's a lot of answers, so we'll have to scroll around. Da -dum, da -dum, da -dum. One more, yeah, there we go. Okay. Um, I think I'll just show these and we will discuss them um, on the slides because it's a little nicer to have the tree alongside it. Um, yeah, so uh, probably should lock this now. Otherwise, you keep changing your mind. Um, it doesn't tell you nothing. That would be a bit useless. It does tell you that P occurs in T in this case. Um, and uh, let's see if I can. Nah, no way. Okay, we'll come. I'll, I'll come back to it. Um, oh, that's the opposite. But um, it also tells you how often the pattern occurs in T, and it tells you where exactly. And uh, for that, um, I'll probably want to go back to the bigger picture and uh, make it real big. So we're looking at this tree and we're trying to find the occurrences of Anna. Oh, this is not an A. Oh, I see. I'm drawing with a dash pen. So we're trying to find Anna. So what we have to do is we start in the root, and now we find the edge with an A. We follow it, then follow the edge with an N, and then the edge with an A. That brings us to this node. So we know, uh, because this node exists, that already means there is at least one suffix of the text that starts uh, with this string. And um, that will be... Uh, that will be enough to know that there is an occurrence. The number of leaves is the number of occurrences and the indices in the leaves is the starting indices of all the occurrences. That's why uh, these are the correct answers. Um, but uh, let's go through this in, in a little slower pace um, again. So the first application of suffix trees is the text indexing problem that we started with. And uh, this is the, the, simple, the simple equivalence that I implicitly already used. P occurs in T if P is a prefix of a suffix in T. Uh, and just maybe because this might be, it might sound more complicated than it really is. Suppose there's occurrence of P and T, so these are all matches. Well, then, of course, uh, you can take this suffix, if there's a position I, you can take this suffix of t, and then p is is just a prefix of that suffix. So it it starts together with this, and um, it's a, a an initial uh, substring of of this green part. Okay, so p is a uh, is a prefix of the suffix of t. Um, but there's there's more to say about this. We have all our suffixes in the suffix tree. So all we have to do is um, follow paths and see what happens. So, um, no. oh, let's do it like this. Here's an algorithm that checks exactly what the occurrences um, are. And this is 
The algorithm I briefly sketched on the example, but spelled out in more detail, because there are a couple of different cases in the general case. What we do is we try to follow a path from the root down the tree by following the letters of P. Now, uh, in the case of Anna, we went down here and then uh, we were in the case that we run out of pattern. We're somewhere in the tree and our pattern is finished. And that meant that uh, we reach some internal node or we stop inside the middle of an edge. Uh, for Anna, it was uh, in an internal node. And if we say look for BA, we would be stopping in the middle of this edge, right? We run out of pattern and we're still in the middle of, of one edge. Both cases are essentially the same. They just mean that P occurs at all the um, leaves in the subtree that are below the point where we stopped. So if we read A and A, let's do this example here again. That means everything in the subtree here, all leaves in there are occurrences of the pattern, in particular uh, at three and one, as you've seen in the example. And uh, similarly, if if you look for BA, you would just get to here, but then everything in the subtree again would be an occurrence of BA. That's probably the easy and intuitive case that we can run into when we're looking for a pattern in the suffix tree. There are two other cases though. Um, one is that we cannot continue. We are stuck in some sense. And um, what, that's, what that means is we're at an internal node and there's no edge with the next character that we would like to read, or we're inside an edge and then the next character doesn't match. So uh, two examples for the two cases could be if we look for NB, uh, that's dotted. If we look for NB, we read N and then we cannot continue with the B. Then we fall out of the tree in a sense. Or we are inside an edge. That can happen if we look for BAA. We start reading like here, like for band, but then the next character is not an N. So uh, we're again falling out of the tree and that means P does not occur in the text. That's the other case. If, if you get stuck in whatever way, you fall out of the tree, then the pattern does not occur. This is the last subtle case, which is we run out of tree. We keep, we have more pattern, but uh, we, um, reach the end of the tree, we reach the leaf. Um, in general, this, this can happen, but it doesn't happen in our case with the dollar sign. If we assume that the pattern cannot contain the dollar sign, we cannot run out of tree because uh, we would have a mismatch with the dollar at this point. So uh, the only option how this could happen is if we, you, you somehow scan past the dollar, but if that doesn't occur in the pattern, it cannot happen. So this case is not really relevant for the text indexing problem. But in general, it can happen if you're using um, tries for, uh, for for more general problems. So it's uh, that's why I listed it here. But for the text indexing problem and uh, the way we use suffix trees at the moment, um, this is not an issue. As a final remark is, how long does this take? Uh, if we reach this internal node, uh, we can either immediately declare there is um, a first occurrence. Remember, this is every such node st stores a pointer to the leftmost leaf. So we can jump to the leftmost leaf and uh, get its index. And that is a, a position in the text where the pattern occurs. If we fall out of the tree, then there's no such pointer and there's nothing to return. We just return no match. Uh, both is possible in time linear in the size of the pattern. And I want to stress how amazing this is one more time. You're 
you're building a web search engine that stores the entire web, but the time to search for a phrase, I don't know, you search for banana, because I'm it's all banana in this mod in this unit. It only takes time uh, proportional to the length of this string banana. It doesn't matter at all how big the data set is. It can be the entire uh, the entire World Wide Web, and that's that's quite um, that's quite remarkable. It, it, it's uh, innocent to state. It's just depending on the pattern, but it's really an amazing result. And uh, suffix trees allow you to get this once you've built your suffix tree for the entire internet. That's only one application of uh, suffix trees. We've already seen a second problem, namely, uh, well, this is almost almost the same. Um, that's the longest repeated substring. So here uh, we're given a single string, t, and we are interested in finding a string that occurs at two different positions. It starts at i and it also starts at j. So again, you know my favorite pictures. Uh, we want the one occurrence at i and one occurrence at j. Um, in principle, we don't we don't object to the fact that these two occurrences can overlap. So i and j could be so that the two occurrences overlap. Um, that's not not principally unthinkable. It would mean that the pattern has a certain periodicity. Think back to unit five. Uh, but that's um, that's not the main the main point for for this application here. Again, the question seems to be how to do the how to do this efficiently. Um, it seems like you have to check all the substrings in in the text. Uh, but it turns out suffix trees can do this for you. And um, let me make this remark, and then um, I'll show you the example. Whenever you have a repeated substring, anything like this. So again, uh, because that was erased, some position where the same pattern occurs. At, at one position i and at another position j. That means there's two suffixes in in the suffix tree, one that starts at i, the entire thing here, and one that starts at j. And uh, they both start with the same shared uh, substring. Now that means they both lead to a certain point in the suffix tree and then branch off in a different, potentially branch off in, in a different direction. And uh, in this application, we know they branch off in a different direction. Otherwise, we would have a longer substring that is also shared. So we could just go one, one more character. So for example, here, uh, again, our favorite, my favorite example, banana bin, a longest common um, two, two suffixes are, are T5 and T7. Um, a ban and an, and uh, they have the longest common prefix of a. They only share the a, obviously. Then they differ in the second letter. Now, how does that um, how is that reflected in the tree? If you take the two suffixes, they correspond to these leaves. Then they're passed from the root. They actually go via here and then here, so they split at this point. And this is exactly an internal node that corresponds to the shared common prefix. Okay, it's a single edge and a single letter here, but uh, in in principle, it could be a longer example. If you take three and one, then they would share Anna all the way down here, and uh, you would have a longer a longer path to the the last uh, common ancestor. Okay, so this is in general true. If you have repeated substrings in a text, that will mean there's shared paths in the suffix tree. And uh, if, if there are longest such shared substrings, there will be an internal node in the suffix tree corresponding to this longest shared repeated substring. Okay. And that means we can exploit this fact. Uh, if you look at the if you look at the tree a little closer, then indeed the uh, the connection is is can be made more explicit. The longest common prefix between two suffixes is exactly this uh, lowest common ancestor 
Um, okay, sorry, I'm jumping ahead of myself. I'm not talking about these yet. Um, the longest repeated substring is simply the longest common prefix of two suffixes. And uh, I was I was confused by the abbreviation, but this is just longest common prefix. Uh, the connection to what I mentioned is if you have two such uh, suffixes, the one starting at one, the one starting at three, their longest common prefix will be this uh, shared part. And uh, it turns out that this is the label of the lowest common ancestor of those two nodes. It's the, the lowest ancestor in the tree that they have in common. But uh, the point I'm making here is if you're looking for the longest repeated substring in the entire string, that is the longest common prefix of any two suffixes. So how do we find this? And that's, that's this algorithm here. The first step is we compute the string depth of all the nodes in the suffix tree. So what, what should that mean? Um, let's make that blue. The string depth is simply how many characters did I have to follow to reach a certain node? And uh, we can start with the root that's at zero. We had, didn't read any characters to get here. If we go down here, we are at one, two, three for this node. Now that looks like it's just the ordinary depth, um, but it, it differs if edges have uh, a whole string as a label, then we jump right from zero to three, okay? So that's that's the string depth. That's the string depth of internal nodes in a suffix tree. Um, the second step is we just find any internal node with the maximal string depth. So in our case, that would be either this one or this one. They actually both have uh, string depth three. And then the label from the root to any of these maximal string depth nodes, that is your longest repeated substring. So we can either take Anna or we can take Ben. Both have three letters and both are repeated and maximal. And that's the longest we can find. So these are very easy algorithms. Once you're given the suffix tree, that would be fairly easy to implement. You walk down the tree once and you can, you can remember what the current string depth is. And then you just um, advance that uh, when you walk down. And then you do a second traversal, visit all the nodes and keep track of what's the, the largest string depth you've ever seen. Very simple to implement once you're given the suffix tree. So you can solve this problem in linear time using the black box that you can also build the suffix tree in linear time. Okay. That was the application of the longest repeated substring. I, I initially mixed it up with um, a, different, a different problem, the one that I mentioned in the introduction, that of the uh, longest shared substring, the longest common substring. And we would really like to um, apply the same, same kind of technique to this one. So obviously these look similar. Uh, the longest repeated substring in one string, it feels like it sh should have to do with this longest common substring of several strings. There's some subtle differences. Uh, we do have restrictions that this um, common substring must lie entirely inside these others. So it's not useful to have, uh, to know that there's two, two occurrences in T1, but none in the others. So it's a bit more restricted, but uh, it's a very similar question. We try to ask for something repeated, but in different strings. So maybe we can solve it in roughly the same way. Um, but uh, an obvious approach would be you build the suffix tree for all the texts, uh, one for T1, one for T2, etc. Uh, but that doesn't really seem to help. Because what you need is connect the information about different texts. You somehow need a single big tree that uh, can represent all the strings. And this exists. That's called the generalized suffix trees. And um, these are, again, um, a little magic device that is often very helpful. Uh, and again, it's uh, the definition is very simple. Um, but uh, they have very profound um, applications then. 
So let's look at what this is. The key idea is you make one large text out of the different texts, but you don't just concatenate them. You put a dollar symbol between the texts and it has to be a different end of end of text marker for each of the texts. So you try to distinguish them all. You just invent new dollars, a dollar one, dollar two, etc. So you can keep all the different original texts separate, but they are embedded in one big string T now. And then we construct the suffix tree for this big string. And um, now if you look at such a, I'll show an example in a second, um, but uh, even without that, it's it's clear that because all these dollars are uh, unique and different, whenever you see a dollar J edge, it has to leave. It has to lead to a leaf. There's no other way. Um, there's no way any other string can share this. Any other suffix can share this. So we essentially have a leaf for every of the for every of the text for every uh, tj and every starting position in the text tj, we have one leaf. And that's the generalized suffix trees. Um, we don't take a single text, we take the suffixes of several texts and all put them into a, a joint suffix tree. Uh, and by building this long text, concatenating the text and separating them, we can use a black box construction for a single suffix tree, for a single string suffix tree, to also get the generalized suffix tree without investing uh, extra brain power. So before we get going with this, um, a little question for you to wake up again. Um, this time I, I just put it as a, as a tag cloud um, so you can put in any string. The question is, what is the longest common substring of these three strings that are given here. Um, we'll use this as an example in a second for the generalized uh, suffix tree, and then you will see how we arrive at the same uh, at the same answer. Um, but uh, I first want to see if you know what the problem is. So remember, the longest common substring has to be a substring of all three strings. You have to find a single string that occurs in all of those three. And then among all of those, you want to find the longest one. Uh, you will see that even for this very small instance, that just these three strings, and they're not even very long, um, it's not completely obvious on first sight what is the longest uh, repeated substring. But um, I'm sure you will figure it out. Uh, I see 10 answers. Um, again, if, if you feel like you have no idea what I'm talking about, um, a valid answer is I'm lost or don't know. Um, and otherwise, uh, try to find the longest common substring of BCA, BCAC, AA, BCA, and BCAA. Great words to pronounce. We have 14 votes. I'd love to see a few more. Can we get our usual 25? And in case you have no idea, you just submit anything random. I like the FFF. Someone sent a number. Don't don't send the, the length. Send the actual string. Maybe you can still edit this. Come on, guys. 25. I want to see 25. We got 26 in the previous, 31 in the first. There must be some people hidden. Twenty is good. Twenty-five would be better. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Results are coming in. That's great. Two more. One more. Tension is rising. There we go. Awesome. Okay, we have lots of votes for BCA, and that is that is correct. Uh, for all the other examples, um, I think AA is... No, all the other examples are not common substrings. They're not um, substrings of all the three. Yeah. 
So BCA um, is, is the correct answer. And um, let's see. How, how would you prove this? Well, you can see the occurrence here in all the three strings. And uh, well, it actually occurs twice in the first one, so you can take any of the two occurrences. Um, and there's there's no longer such string. It's easy in this example to see, well, the, the only longer option would be BCAA because that's the entire last string. And there's no no double A in the first one, so that won't work with all, all three strings. So how can we do this now systematically and using suffix trees? Um, here's an algorithm. And again, this might be a bit small. Um, so uh, of course we start with computing the generalized suffix tree. Uh, there will be an example on the next slide, but I want to give you the, the algorithm first. Um, you compute the generalized suffix tree for all the strings. That is, the core information is in the tree, but you have to add a little extra uh, information to find a, a substring that is common to all substrings. Maybe let me go back um, very briefly to this one. Uh, what we did here is we asked for the longest repeated substring. We asked for any string that occurs at least twice. For that, um, because we use a, a compact try, any internal node of these little dots here, any internal node will have at least two different leaves in its subtree, two different descent, leaf descendants. And so any internal node was fine for getting a repeated substring, okay? Now, in this new problem of um, the longest common substring, this is not enough. We want that this substring occurs in all of the strings. So we have to work a little extra for that. Um, and what we do is we traverse uh, the suffix tree and um, we store at each node the subset of all the strings uh, that have a leaf below it. So each node stores the set of numbers j so that there is a leaf um, j comma i, so uh, that's not an i. Started the the suffix that starts at i in position in in string j. In the subtree, okay. That's that's the idea. Uh, once I have this this computed, and uh, once I have the string depths. Um, I know that I only have to find the deepest, the, the, the node that has, uh, that stores the set of all strings. And among those, the one with the deepest, with the largest string depth. Okay. Remember, uh, every repeated string gives rise to an internal node, but we want an internal node where there's a continuation in all of the strings. So we try to find one the deepest node that is labeled with all of this of the strings and deepest in terms of the string depth. Okay. If you go through this algorithm, uh, computing the suffix tree takes time proportional to the length of all the texts because that's the text we compute and that we compute this the single suffix tree on. And uh, both of the other things um, are linear in the size of the suffix tree, and the suffix tree is linear in the number of characters. So again, here's this, here's this quote from before. We found this linear time algorithm now for this problem. And uh, that's, um, that's proving a, a famous computer scientist wrong. Um, so here's, here's an example that might make this algorithm a little clearer. It's from the same three strings that I asked you about. And um, you can see, so uh, there, are different, there are different leaves. I labeled them here with the actual um, string instead of uh, just the, the, the pair ji. 
But you see that the dollar sign at the end tells you what string it is from, right? So if, if it says here, I don't know, let's pick um, a dollar two, that must be this a as opposed to this a, because it's followed by dollar two, that indicates it's from the second string. Okay, and similarly for all the others. And uh, what you see in green, these are these subsets. Um, so maybe make the entire thing green. Uh, the nodes store these, these subsets in green. That is simply what indices of dollars do I have below me? This node has only $2 and $1, so it stores one, two. This node has $2, $3, and $1, so it stores all three. And so on for all the others. And you compute you can compute this bottom up. Um, if you're if you're a node that only has leaves, you just walk through all the leaves and check what dollars are there, and you take note of the result. If you're an internal node with several children, uh, then you just take the union of all of these. You have dollar one, dollar two, dollar three. That would already be enough, but you take the union also with two, three, and uh, one, two. I hope the example um, is enough to, to help you see what this algorithm is doing by computing these green sets, uh, this, the collection of all uh, dollar indices in the leaves below this node. The second step is computing the string depths again, and that's exactly as we've seen it before. So um, let me just add these here. And uh, that's two, that's a four, and uh, here another two. And now we try to find the deepest node that uh, has all, all three letters, uh, all three strings in its label. So we, we can only take this node, this node, this node, this node, this node. And uh, clearly this one is the one that's deepest. And it's labeled by BCA, our longest common substring. Okay. These are the elementary applications, the, the ones that use a suffix tree, suffix tree in an almost straightforward way. It's overdue time for a little break. And uh, so let's, let's do this. Um, I just want to see how much time we'll have, if it makes sense to start this next part or not. The next subsection is fairly short, so let's um, let's do a three-minute break then. All right. You already know how this works. Um, it's a good time to think about questions or spend your time uh, whichever way you want. Uh, see you again in a few minutes for um, a little second round of applications of suffix trees. And um, I guess that will be all we can do before the Easter break. And you'll have to wait to see how you can construct these in linear time till after the break. A long cliffhanger, but uh, seems to be the only option.
almost at 1218. So time to slowly get back to working mode. Give you another second to get back into position. There's one more really nice result that um, that I want to introduce here. And that will be the second magic black box that uh, we will see today and will result later in the module. In the previous subsection, we've, saw, we've seen some immediate applications of suffix trees to solve various strings problems. It turns out for uh, various other problems, you need a little extra information. Uh, the suffix tree alone is not quite enough to solve these. And uh, what we need in addition are these longest common extensions. The suffix trees are a key step to efficiently answer such queries. So it will it will build and use on sub it will build on suffix trees and use these as before. But uh, a little ad additional step can uh, boost their power substantially. So what what are these longest common extensions? Um, it's a a problem of independent interest, but we'll see um, more specific use cases of it. Um, it's it's the following problem. You're given a string, as always in the last couple of units, right? Uh, and we want to answer these LCE queries, longest common extension queries. So what are these queries? Here you're given two positions in the text. So uh, as always, uh, I like to draw these pictures to make things a little more graphical. You're looking at two positions in the text. And now you'd like to know how far can you jointly scan to the right where you see the same string. Okay. So formally, LCE of two positions i and j is uh, the longest extension. It's the maximal L so that the length L substring starting at i and starting at j of t are equal. Okay. But imagine you have you have two pointers that uh, that look at, at these positions i and j, and you ask how long can you move them to the right in lockstep uh, before you find different characters. That's the longest common extension uh, problem. It turns out the information we need to solve this problem is already contained in the suffix tree. Clearly, uh, any two positions in t correspond to a suffix starting at this position. So the longest common extension of i and j in t is nothing but the longest common prefix of two suffixes, namely the suffix starting at i and j. Again, if you look at this picture, um, if you start at i and j, if you take the suffix starting here and the suff second suffix starting here, well, clearly the longest common prefix, the longest prefix that these two suffixes both have in common that's nothing different than uh, this longest common extension. It's just a, a different way of asking for it. Um, maybe formally, we should say the length of this thing. The longest common extension really is, is an integer. It's the length of this uh, extension. And um, well, maybe n depends on who defines it. Um, here, I define it as the length. Sometimes people also use the actual string. Uh, let's leave it at that at, at, as, as that. So the the confusion I'm I'm mentioning is both longest common prefix and longest common extension can either be the length of these um, shared strings or it can be the string itself. Depending on the application, one or the other is more convenient to use, but it's really the same thing. If you have the length, you know where it starts in the string, so it's just the the substring starting at that position. So we already know what this is. It's the same thing, just a different name for the longest common prefix of two suffixes. And that again was, remember, we used this before um, when we were talking about the longest repeated substring. That is the string depth of the longest common ancestor of i and j. I mentioned the term at the time already. Uh, so if, if you remember the example there was we had um, ban a ban, and we had uh, an, 
and we were asking for the longest common substring of these two. And we found that this was just the A. And the reason is that uh, we would walk A band to this leaf and A and to this leaf. And uh, the longest, the lowest common ancestor of these two leaves is, is this node. That's the last node they have in common when we walk the root to leaf path. So um, in short, and this is really uh, highlighted here because you should remember this. Um, I'll, we'll review it after Easter, but we'll use this uh, later on. The longest common extension of two positions, as we've just argued lengthily, is nothing but the longest common prefix of these two suffixes. And that is the string depth of the lowest common ancestor of those two leaves with the given indices. So you see, in all, in all of these uh, three terms, the uh, numbers i and j are involved. Either it's the starting positions in the text, or it's the starting positions of an, an index of, an, of a suffix. So it's the the name of a suffix, if you like, or it's the name of a leaf. But it's really the same same numbers in all cases. So uh, do remember this one. Um, we'll come back to it uh, after the Christmas break. How can we? Uh, answer these LCE queries, we could do simple things. We could uh, start at the leaves and walk up the tree until we find a, a common node. That is possible, but um, it can be slow. If, in the worst case, you have to walk through the entire tree and there's no uh, no no bound on the height of a suffix tree uh, better than linear. The other, all, the other option would be um, we pre-compute all the possible LCAs, LCEs, uh, longest common extensions or lowest common ancestors. Uh, we can comp pre-compute all the lowest common ancestors in a big table, uh, but that table is very big. So even just writing it out to memory would take quadratic time. And that again is not interesting for the problems we have. We can't afford this. Again, uh, an amazing result is that you can compute a data structure in linear time and space. And then after that computes the lowest common ancestors of any two leaves in constant time. It's just blink of your eye and uh, you get the answer. Uh, this one is a little tricky to understand, but um, if we have time at the end of the module, I want to be I want to introduce you to how to do this, um, even though it will not be part of the uh, exam material. Uh, again, a clearly a theoretical breakthrough, uh, but also useful in practice because there are um, implementations that do this very efficiently. Uh, and so this is uh, this has again been together with suffix trees. These two things are game changers in in stringology. Uh, for now, we'll treat the construction of these of this data structure for lowest common ancestors as a black box. So um, you you may remember this um, after linear time preprocessing. We can compute the suffix tree and the longest, the lowest common ancestors in the suffix tree. And that together gives us the longest common extensions in a string in constant time after the pre-processing. And uh, this is something you can use for uh, even more interesting problems like this one. Um, that's the approximate matching problem. Remember so far, we were given a text and we were looking for exact matches of our pattern in the text. Uh, often this is a little too strict, especially if humans type the patterns. Uh, so here we're given a text and a pattern and additionally a parameter, a number k. And we're now interested in um, a match, well, the first match again, where uh, the part of the text and the pattern don't have to be exactly the same, but they have to be within Hamming distance of K. And um, so Hamming distance, that's just counting the number of mismatch characters. The number of positions where the characters are, are different. Okay. If there's no such match, uh, no such position where we can find something within having distance k, then we report no match. Otherwise, we report the first occurrence. 
So in a sense, it's it's like searching with typos. You can uh, substitute one letter for another, and it will still uh, find find the occurrences in the text. Okay. What we'll do here is we do a similar trick as for the generalized suffix tree. Uh, we take the text and the pattern and make a single string out of it, but we separate it with dollars so that uh, we know when, when these things end. And now we construct the longest common extensions on this combined string. Um, and you, you can basically do this. Uh, you, you build the generalized suffix tree and then compute um, the lowest common ancestors in the generalized suffix tree. So this is um, going from one string to several strings is again um, with similar tricks as we've seen for the generalized suffix tree is again possible here. So we can use longest common extensions also in different strings and it works in essentially the same way. A little poll, but I don't have um, much time left for this one. So I'll just leave it running, but uh, continue with the example just to see if you are fine with the definition of uh, hamming distance. So just put in the number for this one. Um, and uh, really, so the distance between those two, the hamming distance is the number of characters where there's a mismatch between those two. Um, I think this is easy enough. Uh, I do want to at least state this algorithm, um, but uh, we might have to come back to this after the Easter break because we're running a little short on time. <clears throat> um, in essence, you can use the lowest common, the longest uh, extension, longest common extension between the text and the pattern to jump over the matching parts. So you have a certain position i. Now you try to to see if the pattern at this point matches. Um, but we don't want to spend um, we don't don't want to spend a lot of time n times m to check all the characters. So what we'll do, that's why it's called the kangaroo algorithm, we'll jump over the matching parts using longest common extensions. Then there might be a mismatch at one character, but then we just continue jumping after it. And so we can find in n times k time all the matches with at most k hamming distance. Uh, I'll, I'll go through the algorithm after the break. Um, a little bit again uh, and its generalizations. Um, it's too beautiful an algorithm to be rushed now. So uh, we'll we'll start again with this application of longest common extensions after the Easter break. Um, so much for that. Um, the the answer for the heart and beard is is two because they agree in the middle part, the ear, but then H and B and T and D is different. So uh, two is the right answer, just for the record. Um, I wish you a lovely Easter break. I do want to see you um, right after for the tutorial. So please don't forget this. Um, we have the, well, this is, sorry about that. Um, I have another one. Same link, but no, I want this one. Uh, same same link, just uh, to keep everything orderly. I named it with uh, tutorial sheet four. So do join the Zoom in, in two to three minutes when I have my act together. And if, if you can't make it today, uh, I wish you uh, a relaxing and helpful Easter break. Uh, take, take some time off to relax from a very intense term with weird restrictions, probably even even worse than the first term. And uh, hopefully things will slowly get better after the break. But uh, definitely teaching will continue in the way we have it now. So it gives you um, planability. I wish you a good time uh, and hope to see you with all with uh, fresh energy and enthusiasm for algorithms after the break. And hope to see many of you right now in our 
uh, tutorial slash social Zoom chat. That's it for now. Don't forget the tutorial at 4 p.m., but that's with Ben, um, as, as always. Uh, bye for now, guys. See you on Zoom.